G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to Unparliamentary, our fortnightly show that gives you the scoop on what's happening in federal politics with a special guest journalist every week. I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Nambri country and pay my respects to Elders past and present. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, so it's always been a big fortnight in politics and the last fortnight is no different. The coalition is now almost actively campaigning against Labor's 2030 emissions target, arguing that the government isn't going to meet it and as such there's no point in having a target and they'll abandon it. Both major parties have been very critical of the Greens over their stance on Israel's, Israel's war on Palestine. Defence Industry Minister Pat Conroy accused the Greens of spreading misinformation over arms exports to Israel. The opposition leader has said that they've been condoning anti-Semitism um, and lots of other accusations being thrown around there. And, of course, after weeks of pressure over the weekend, uh, the nine media problems bubbled over. Allegations of misconduct, bullying, sexual harassment and a toxic workplace have been levelled at the network over recent weeks. And then uh, last week we saw Chair Peter Costello uh, be accused of uh, knocking a reporter back to the, to the ground at Canberra Airport and he resigned over the weekend. So lots to get into uh, this week and we're joined by Karen Middleton, political editor of Guardian Australia, to get stuck into all this. Thanks for joining us, Karen. Thanks for having me, Ebony. Um, so I did want to start with climate and uh, we've seen a whole host of announcements in recent weeks and a lot of developments. Um, I want to start with, though, the 2030 target and more or less the coalition abandoning this. Can you tell us a little bit about what the coalition has said in recent days and and its political significance, I guess? So it kind of depends what day and who's talking. <laughs> we've, just, we've just had a press conference again this morning from Peter Dutton, um, which clarified but but didn't the position. So going back to the weekend, there was an interview in the Australian, which Peter Dutton gave to mark his two years as opposition leader. And in that interview, he made a comment that uh, the government wasn't going to meet its uh, 2030 emissions reduction target, which is 43% uh, on 2005 levels by 2030 reduction, and that if you're not going to meet it, there's no point in having one. So that sort of set the hairs running because it was reopening a debate I guess we sort of thought was settled. You might remember going back to the Morrison government in, I think, 2021 in the lead up to the 22 election, um, Scott Morrison negotiated with his nationals, coalition partners, to get agreement to endorse net zero. Um, that was controversial as enough, and that was net zero emissions by 2050, which is also a part of this whole agreement. Um, but the 2030 targets were also a bit controversial because of the potentially the steepness, um, the, the, rap, the rapidity of change shift to renewables or non-fossil fuel energy in order to achieve that. And that's where the controversy lies within the coalition. The nationals in particular are very agitated about that. The coalition broadly is detecting anxiety in the community, in some areas of the community, about the speed of that transition, what it means for them, particularly in rural and regional areas, but not only there. We've heard stuff about people being angry about wind farms. We've heard stuff about people being angry about transmission lines going through their properties. And so what the coalition is doing is trying to capitalise on all of this anxiety. And so they're now suggesting, well, um, we're still we're still in the camp for net zero by 2050, but we may not be in the camp for getting there um, at the same pace in terms of the, the markers on that. And what Peter Dutton has just said today is... Um, we're, basically, we're not going to set a 2030 target in opposition. If we win government, we would set one then. So we've had a number of mixed messages since his foray on Saturday. We saw Ted O'Brien, his energy spokesman, saying, oh, no, no, we are still going to have targets. They're just going to be different. Um, we've we've heard them saying they're still committed to the Paris Agreement, which requires that you have targets and attempt to meet them. Uh, so we have a range of very confusing messages. But the bottom line, I think, from Peter Dutton today is they're not planning to tell us what their 2030 target would be until after they win government and whether or not they would set one then. They say they will. 
but um, but they're not promising that. Um, it, it, not promising any information on that. Yeah. Uh, and just the Nats, you know, saying like National Party leader David Littleproud been saying in the last 24 hours um, that it won't be as linear a path to net zero as we have at the moment. That suggests kind of, you know, this and then suddenly net zero. Um, that, that implication of that is fossil fuels for longer than gas, then, then nuclear, which they think will um, rapidly reduce emissions but take a long time to get there. And so we'll keep fossil fuels in the meantime. Mm. And I guess kind of worth pointing out, I was listening to uh, the Climate Change Minister, Chris Bowen, on Radio National this morning, just before you were on, in fact, um, and he was more or less pointing out, well, the reason why we know that we're perhaps not going to meet the target is because the government is very transparent about these things and is reporting on it regularly and also pointed out that they're going to miss it. The difference would be 42% compared to achieving their 43% target. So it's not like missing the target by a wide mile, but as you've pointed, the coalition is kind of seizing on this as a political opportunity. Yeah, well, well, to be fair, that's a guesstimate. But the government is saying, uh, based on our current um, estimates, we're at 42 and that doesn't include the measures we had in the budget. And so if you include those, we're confident we're going to meet the target. The coalition is is drawing on comments from a range of people, including um, from the Grattan Institute, suggesting that actually it might not be as simple as that and that they might fall short uh, more substantially than they're suggesting. So that that's the basis of the coalition argument. They're saying um, if you're not going to meet the target, why would you go for Why would you set that target? And the subtext there is we're being straight with you, they're not. Um, so, in fact, there's a number of arguments running that even aren't just about climate here. They're about other things in the political campaign space, um, but certainly that they're running, this is the agenda they're running on climate and they're suggesting the government isn't as reliable, isn't going to meet the target, can't be trusted, uh, and then why would you set a target if it's if it's just hypothetical? I mean, it's a weird argument to me. We set targets for things like closing the gap and all kinds of other things. How do you know if you're on track to anywhere unless you've set a target that you're accountable for? A bit like, oh, if we can't win it, we'll take our button ball and go home. Um, but I am kind of interested. I mean, there's politically, obviously, the coalition is focusing a lot on uh, nuclear, but we still haven't heard uh, much in respect of that. Do you think Labor is happy to have a fight over the Paris targets and, and nuclear energy? I mean, in the background, they seem to be encouraging a lot more uh, uh, focus on gas. Um, and I know they're trying to um, push up their renewable cred- credentials and, and other aspects of the green economy, but there's still a lot of support from the Resources Minister for expanding fossil fuels um, in Australia. This strikes me as, you know, electorally, it's it's a pretty good um, environment for both Labor and the coalition. You know, no one's really talking about fossil fuels. Yes. So uh, there's a lot, a lot in there. If we go firstly to the gas thing, I think Labor, that there are pressure points on the climate issue for Labor as well, because uh, in, in relation to that, um, there is concern in the community and going back to what I said about anxiety, there's also some concern about the reliability of renewables. It's coming, that's coming up in focus groups. And so gas, the emphasis on gas from the government is to reassure people that there will be a baseload power source uh, in as part of the transition. And they, I think they think that gas is the least worst, that people don't have the same reaction to gas as they do to coal. So they've kept gas in the mix. They are also pointing offshore to our export contracts and saying we want to keep open an export market for when we transition from gas to, say, hydrogen and other greener energy sources. And so we've got to be a reliable supplier. So there's a range of arguments they're making there. But politically, as you suggest, the progressive side of the Labor Party that has expectations about a more rapid reduction of fossil fuel um, use and certainly about not opening new gas fields, and that was a prospect that was in the new future gas strategy, are not happy about mm-hmm. that. I did a story recently. I had an audio recording of um, uh, some comments that Wayne Swan, the Labor Party president, made to the Labor Environment Action Network, the progressive 
you know, environmental activist branch of the Labor Party, where he was sympathising with their um, unhappiness about the future gas strategy and the fact that it talked about the use of gas to 2050 and beyond. And beyond, yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and also the opening of new gas fields. And he he endorsed their concerns about those things. So there's clearly beyond just the activist wing of the Labor Party into corners like Wayne Swan, who's a Queenslander from the right, mm. uh, there is concern in the Labor Party about how this is being explained and whether there's an adequate commitment to um, clear commitment to a reduction of fossil fuel in fossil fuel use earlier. But the other flip side of that is the nervousness around, um, you know, if if renewables, if if an idea takes hold in the community that renewables are not reliable, if the power goes out, you know, if the lights go out, if, if we get... Um, blackouts during the summer and their the idea is that renewables are not reliable as a transition that that is politically super difficult for the government so they're weighing all those things up on that part mm. on nuclear um i think the coalition thinks that nuclear is less of a toxic option than it once was if you ask people would you be prepared to consider nuclear power because it's a cleaner energy source zero emissions ultimately People say yes. If you ask them a different kind of question about having a re reactor next door, then you get the fish with three eyes, you know, um, from the Simpsons kind of analogy yeah. coming out. Um, so people. That's very soft support. Like once you dig into it, yeah. Correct. Um, so there's concern about that, about safety issues and proximity issues. There's also concern about the time it will take and the money it will take. And we saw that recent Gen a Gen Cost report, the um, CSIRO yeah, report. Was, yeah, that, that that belled the cat on both of those things. So I think Labor does feel it's got a ready-made ready -made campaign against the nuclear um, issue for the coalition, and we haven't yet seen the sites where they would locate reactors, as you mentioned, and that keeps getting pushed back and back and back. And there was concern inside the coalition that that whole thing was flagged without thinking about a messaging strategy or how to counter the concerns about both safety and the, the time and cost concerns. I think they've they've pulled back and they've been working on that. Uh, and they feel that the, com the combination of these two things, the, the concerns about renewables, uh, they can use that to try and bolster their argument about nuclear. So I think we'll see those two arguments they're doing a kind of a one two they've, they've come out with this stuff about 2030 and the targets we'll see the nuclear policy in more detail soon and then they'll try and knit those things together i think to say here's a here's a baseload power source that is more reliable and clean and you can trust and you don't need to rely on um, renewables so heavily early on you can rely on gas now how that flies i don't know mm. Did run has run successful nuclear scare uh, advertising in the past. In fact, they drew on uh, a report the Australia Institute <laughs> back in 2006 and used some proposed sites that were listed from a research paper to uh, run an, an, a very potent ad in Queensland. I think the slug line for those of us old enough to remember um, the old tourism slogan was Queensland, beautiful one day, nuclear the next. <laughs> so I think they're hoping to rerun that kind of thing in key places once we know those sites. Yeah. Well, if people want to check that out on our website, it's from a long time ago, but really we know nuclear has been around for a long time. We do know the key things that it needs in order to to run a conventional uh, nuclear power station. And a lot of that hasn't changed. You know, you've got to have access to water and all those kinds of things. So you can uh, check that out on the Australia Institute website. Um, but yeah, it is a really, I just, climate continues to be um, really electrical, ele electorally difficult for both the major parties because, you know, the coalition, obviously, um, it just keeps tearing itself apart. It can't decide on any energy policy and this seems to be no different. You know, Dutton kind of flagged nuclear and then just zero details about it have been forthcoming. But obviously for Labor um, you know, it still needs to be appealing to those inner city um, seats that the coalition appears to have just given up on that the that the Teals did really well in last time around. Uh, and it does have to still be credible on, on climate change in the lead up to the next election. So, yeah, I think a long way to go on this one. But I was really fascinated by those comments from um, Wayne Swan, the Labor president, as you mentioned, coming from Queensland, you know, one of our biggest coal states. I thought that was um, 
really interesting and um yeah it feels like um feels like uh, the independents and greens will be making a lot out of this as we head to the next federal election um I will also just mention before we move on to the next issue, um, the Australian Institute thinking particularly about gas. Last week we released um, new research looking at the gas industry and the royalties that it pays. And if people want to check that out, what we found was um, on just over half of the gas exported from Australia, zero royalties are paid whatsoever, um, which is pretty rubbish. So you can go ahead and check that out. And we did a joint press conference with Senator David Pocock and Monique Ryan, the independent MP for Kuyong. Um, Karen, the next one I want to come to is also a, a political live wire. Um, it's Israel's war on Gaza and how that's playing out um, politically here in Australia. The major parties have kind of um, banded together to try and pin the Greens as being really radical and out of line with the community on here. Um, Greens leader Adam Bent has hit back at um, some comments from the Attorney General in particular. Can you just paint us a, a picture of, I guess, the the last week or so? What have the developments been in this in this space? In twenty five words or less. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, there's so there are a number of issues going on involved here. There's there's politicking, obviously. Um, the Greens and Labor, if you look at just the politics, you know, the Greens and Labor are competing for an overlapping constituency. The, the Labor Party is concerned that the Greens are posing a threat in some Labor-held seats. We saw the Greens take some seats in Queensland, um, including one prominent seat from the Labor Party. And they've got their eye on other seats, particularly Victoria, seat of Wills, for example, and some other ones. And so there's a political thing going on um, that is part of the Prime Minister attacking the Greens last week in Parliament in relation to egging on the protesters. However, there's also um, a genuine concern about where those protests are headed and the atmosphere in the community as far as tensions, social cohesion, a sort of tinderbox atmosphere here uh, that is related to the goings on in the Middle East. And <clears throat> law enforcement is reporting concern about it. Uh, it's coming up in all kinds of research. People generally are very agitated and angry about a whole range of issues, not even just that. The cost of living, um, pressure on from the tr energy transition, uh, the war in Ukraine, the war in Gaza, general security, China, uncertainty, all of it is making people agitated. And if you talk to people who study these things, the, they say that seeing anger played out in the community, even if it's anger about an issue that they personally are not engaging with, can inflame anger. So there is concern about what might happen, mm. as, particularly as a result of these protests outside the offices of MPs. Um, the offices have been blockaded. Staff have had trouble getting in and out. There have been bricks through the window, paint sprayed around. They're getting anxious about what could happen, not necessarily deliberately, but just the madness of crowds. When people get together and everyone's already angry and then they get worked up, things can happen that you don't intend. So I think as well as the politicking that I talked about, the Prime Minister was also genuinely frustrated that he felt the Greens were encouraging people to protest and, and protest is is important and you know essential in our democracy but doing that in a way that was whipping them up and and sort of creating a permission a permissive atmosphere for for it going too far um now the greens disputed that and they said they were not encouraging anyone to be violent they were not encouraging anything more than peaceful protest um, I do note that Adam Bant has, has spoken more loudly about peaceful protest in the days since then. So he is, he is making a more deliberate effort, it seems, in, in the public domain to emphasise that. Um, so they are, I think, the elements that we've seen emerge in the context of what became a pretty heated debate in the parliament. Anthony Albanese took a question from Sophie Scomps, which was a question about social cohesion, the independent MP, he took the opportunity then to attack the Greens and accuse them of being irresponsible for egging on these protesters. Peter Dutton then used um, one of the protocols in the parliament that allows leaders to be given indulgence to speak because the question was in question time. He then got up and associated himself with the answers and joined the Prime Minister in clobbering, clobbering the Greens and then used it to go further and make some further comments that he didn't support with evidence about accusing protesters of being Holocaust deniers and 
talking about anti-Semitism and the like. So everyone's got their own political agendas and their own agendas in relation to their positions on the, managing the, the fallout from the Middle East events. Um, but there is also this underlying security. And then Adam Bank got up and had his say back and said, we don't, we dispute all of that. But but I do detect mm -hmm. since then um, some more, as I say, um, emphasis from him on peaceful protest. So a number of things in going in all, all coming together there, some um, sort of substantive and some political. Yeah. And of course, the Greens, they're really representing a lot of genuine um, community concern about what is actually happening in Gaza and uh, what a lot of uh, organisations are calling um, genocide and that, you know, the government doesn't really appear to have done much apart from express concerns on things and just the level of violence that we're seeing on social media, the number of civilians being killed every day, the ongoing threat of starvation. I mean, we've seen schools, ambulances, hospitals, UN workers, aid workers, journalists, um, as well and as... Just, and just Palestinian family. civilians who are not, not Hamas, yes. Exactly. Yes. And, um, you know, so like there is uh, also, it's worth recognising this very strong um, community sentiment that the government needs to be doing more um, as well, which is obviously the reason for all the protests. Yeah, and that's the role that protests play. That's the role protests play in our democracy is holding governments to account. Um, and the the argument is where it really, I guess, is about where protest, where that legitimate protest ends and dangerous activity starts and that's the quibble that I guess the Prime Minister had but certainly you know the Greens are tapping into a, a very live sentiment as demonstrated by these weekly protests in Melbourne in particular in the centre of Melbourne where people are coming out in their many thousands to say how distressed they are about the Middle East you know there's I suppose there's an argument about the role that a, the Australian government plays in terms of um, how much influence it has but equally on the other side of it there's a, an argument in principle at the very least if not more practically that the government could use its voice more loudly and do things more emphatically um, it's a complicated issue but certainly protesters are demonstrating the high level of concern in the community about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to turn now to not every journalist's favourite topic, which is the media um, and just the reflections from the last week. I mean, Nine has been under a lot of pressure around um, allegations about one of its senior executives um, and some sexual harassment allegations, but also kind of a toxic culture of bullying. Uh, last week, we saw a journalist from The Australian, worth pointing out, a competitor to Nine, uh, bailing up the chair of Nine, ex-treasurer, former treasurer Peter Costello, at the airport and on camera appeared to knock the journalist down. He made allegations that uh, that's what um, Peter Costello had done, which Costello denied. And then, yeah, we saw that kind of come to a head over the weekend with him um, resigning. Um, uh, I mean... Things are looking pretty bad at, at nine there. Uh, there's a new um, executive taking over, but not a good look for the head of a media organisation to be bodying a journalist. Well, that was the problem for Peter Costello. Um, the video appeared to show him move towards the journalist. Now, he, as you said, denied that. So there's debate about, about that. Um, but at the very least, when the journalist fell, we could hear him laughing and he didn't render assistance. So even if you want to set aside who started it, um, that's not a very good look either. And when you're the chair of a media organisation, when your own journalists do that, I mean, a current affair, that's what it's known for, is chasing people down the street with a camera. Um, and so it, it looked like a very big double standard and a refusal to take responsibility and answer questions. And so that was why he has ended up resigning because I think Nine had enough pressure on it over the allegations you just outlined before and that was what he was being asked about, his response to those allegations. Uh, and then when you have the chair appear to show a disregard for someone's safety and um, and not, not want to respond to the allegations, you, you're really in a difficult situation and then we had you know a video that looked like a visible um demonstration of a of a of a media network not not wanting to uh disclose what was going on inside inside 
in, in relation to these allegations. So for all of these reasons, uh, Peter Costello is no longer the chair of, of the nine. Yeah, and it's like it's been a tumultuous couple of weeks for the Australian media in general and, and months, I guess, or well, in a decade, you know, like <laughs> it's um things are, are tough out there, but we've also seen um, you know, Laura Tingle, um, the chief political correspondent of the ABC come under fire from uh from the coalition and a lot of the Murdoch press um, for comments that she made at the Sydney Writers Festival, really kind of um, taking aim at the ABC and allegations of of bias and a bit of a, a pile on there. Meta has announced that it's withdrawing from the news media bargaining code. That's going to be a revenue stream for public interest journalism that dries up. Um, I know you used to work at public broadcaster SBS many years back. Do you have any reflections on kind of a couple of those developments in the media over the last month or so? Well, there's also the criticism of the Seven Network for its handling of the Bruce Lerriman interview yes. in the Bruce Lerriman case. So yeah. uh, the, the sort of blowtorch has moved from organisation to organisation <laughs> With um, varying degrees of um, reasonableness, I suppose, and uh, and then some political agendas at play and some media competition agendas at play in there too. Um, you know, we're, we in the media are in the business of um, uh, public information and so those of us who work in the media know that we have a sort of public job. So... In that respect, I, you know, I'm not. It's unsurprising and probably not unreasonable that media companies face um, a fair degree of scrutiny, because it's a significant position in the community. But I do think, you know, a number of the things you touched on, like the pressures of social media versus traditional media, things that are putting financial pressure on media organisations, the advances of technology, um, all of these things are changing the nature of of um, what, what we in the commercial and, and indeed public broadcasting media do, in, in, you know, the way our jobs are done in these days. And I think that's adding to the sort of um, fraught nature of the debate. And I also think the public now feels more empowered to engage directly with the companies and holding the companies to account. And that's in part or in large part, I think, the advent of social media and the sense that we have more direct engagement with a whole lot of people and organisations. And naturally that we we talk back now. Um, we we being individuals in the public domain talk back to, to big companies, we talk back to governments, we no longer meekly accept what they say. And so I think that the whole environment has changed about in terms of accountability um, of organisations. Certainly when I worked at SBS, we were acutely aware that we were a public broadcaster um, that that made us, um, well, certainly I'll speak for myself, made me very conscious of the way I articulated things and the implications of what I might be saying. But also people had agendas um, and would be looking for a reason or for a way to trip you up sometimes, whether that be another media company or a political party that had an agenda that was a bit anti-public broadcasting. Um, all sorts of agendas can be at play. So it's very tricky to be uh, at a public broadcaster in particular and trying to navigate all of that and faithfully do your job and and make criticism where criticism is warranted. And I think another thing that's now in the atmosphere, particularly in light of the events in the Middle East, is there's so much sensitivity around that issue that whenever you speak about that issue as a person trying to make um, engage in, in analysis, there's a great deal of pressure to always say on the one hand, on the other hand, on, you know, put all sides of the story all together. And I think that is kind of expanding into, into political journalism generally. And sometimes it is very warranted to make a criticism of one, one politician, one side of politics, one individual um, in its own right. And But now there's this sort of if you say that you're biased or if you don't put the entire context around it all in one breath, you're, you're not being fair and faithful. So it, it is quite a tricky area to navigate and to be seen to be being faithful and you know maybe sometimes people are biased I, I, I don't know I can only speak for myself but I'm super conscious of trying to present um, as many points of view as fairly as possible but also where some whether you think something is warranting of criticism and being being able to make that criticism and, and hoping that you have the credibility to be heard as a as a legitimate and genuine player and, and a person who's attempting to be fair. I've lost your audio there. 
sorry, I have myself on mute because I was coughing. I'm still a little bit <laughs> unwell from last week. Yeah, because I think, um, you know, we talk about it um, a lot when we we think about public broadcasting in particular, but, you know, you, you're striving for impartiality, but there's often this idea that um, balance is the number one thing. And well, and you, that's in the eye of the beholder of it. Exactly. Too. Like if, do you measure it in column centimetres? Do you measure it in minutes where you mention someone's name? It's very hard. To yeah. Measure. And I just think it's a bit of a, a fool's errand and, and it ca really can be weaponized against public broadcasting in particular um, who are accountable to the public and to the parliament in a way that commercial media is not, um, <clears throat> you, you know, used as a weapon to to beat them around for bias and really try and cow public broadcasting, as he said, by people with agendas, whether that's politicians or commercial competitors who see public broadcasting as a, a bit of a, a threat. Um, well, we might go to questions from the audience. Uh, and just a reminder, we've got um, close to 300 people on the line with us today. Thanks for joining us. We had um, close to 700 registered uh, today, so thanks for your interest. A reminder that you can type in questions for Karen into the Q&A box, and you can also upvote other people's questions and comment on them. That will make it easier for me to find them all. Thank you very much. Um, the top question, oh, hang on, let me do these by upvotes. The top question is from... Um, Bridget, who asks, is the reason the coalition doesn't want to have a 2030 target because they want to go nuclear, which wouldn't come to fruition until after that time? So those things are connected for sure. And I think it's a sort of a complicated equation involving keeping the nationals engaged, being able to, to still engage with the climate debate. So we've moved on, in a sense, from the old, old days of the climate wars where the coalition you know, was run by climate sceptics and didn't want to um, even engage, you know, just just blew everything up. Now they have acknowledged um, that we need to do something about climate change and they continue to be signed up to net zero emissions by 2050 and they're not backing away from that. So that's the, that's the context in which all this is happening. But what they're looking for is a form of baseload power that um, can be seen to be... Uh, non-emitting, if you like, in the traditional fossil fuel sense. So um, they can say we've got a, you know, and I put inverted commas around this clean because I know people, you know, but I'm I'm using their language and quoting them, form of energy um, that's not fossil fuel and will allow us to reduce our emissions to that goal. Um, it's also an old a gender item for the coalition. They've long believed in nuclear power. It was very, very unpopular to the point of toxicity a long, long time ago. There's remained a moratorium on it in this country other than Lucas Hearts for medical purposes. So there's, there's an ideological and, you know, a, a belief in that um, there. But there's it also enables them to say, well, um, we'll have to keep fossil fuels, you know, in the meantime. And so mm. I think that's making the nationals very happy and there's a traditional constituency that will be happy to hear that from the coalition. So there are a number of reasons why I think they've um, chosen this path. You know, on the face of it, Labor people and some in their own coalition, as we talked about before, think it's a bit crazy um, and dangerous, crazy brave politically because mm. there is a ready-made campaign you could run against it. Well, can I just ask you about that just as a to build off the back of that? Because, you know, you talked about the support for nuclear being quite soft when you scratch the surface. People have a lot of um, fears about it. But it also strikes me in the middle of a cost of living crisis where people are really noticing that, like, electricity prices going up, insurance prices going up, like, nuclear is more than double, supposed to be more than double the cost, like, that strikes me as a really politically risky thing in this in this economy, nuclear, like and that's right. double the cost of electricity. That is resonating with people and that's where that the report we talked about earlier with the timeline of 15 years plus an $8.6 billion cost or something, that is really resonating with people. So in the past it used to be just the fear of an accident and having a nuclear power plant nearby. Now it's both of those things. But when you say this, there's that soft you know, there's a bit of soft sort of generic support. It's soft in, in a whole range of directions. It's people who could also be persuaded 
potentially in favour if they hear the right arguments. And so I think that's what the coalition is trying to zero in on, those mm. people in the middle who in principle think maybe they wouldn't rule it out because we've got to move away from fossil fuels, we need a reliable energy source, maybe they'll think about it. If the coalition can make arguments that can persuade those people, then they may not find it's as bad. But the Labor Party certainly thinks they've got an ad, you know, they're ready to go, they, they, they're saying bring it on so it's going to be an interesting contest on who wins the the messaging and the persuasion battle on that front but it is all all tied up together and I think as I said before that's why we're starting to see them lay the groundwork with this 2030 thing because it's connected yeah uh, the next first question is from Charlie Bell who asks uh, why is it that the large protests in capital cities uh, are not getting as much coverage on our evening news broadcasts is it self-censorship self-interest um, as a former TV broadcaster, do you have any thoughts on why those protests, like why are we getting coverage of the politics and not the protests themselves as much? Um, I think probably, and, you know, I, I'm bracing for the clobbering I'm going to get for saying this, but I think, you know, when the protests first occur, they get coverage. And then if they continue to occur um, until something different happens, they don't get coverage. And that may well be why you are seeing things happen that the government is now worried are, are becoming dangerous. So I'm, you know, I'm a bit loath to put it in those those terms, but, I, but in terms of news organisations, they report things when they're new and they don't necessarily report things when they're not new. And so that is probably part of it. Um, I mean, I'm not making decisions about covering rallies, um, but that tends to be the general approach to any subject, really. Um, if if we've reported on it already and things haven't materially changed in a sense of a policy or in a um, the nature of an argument, uh, we won't necessarily report them until things have changed. And um, in Parliament, I suppose, you, know, you get the theatrics and the dynamics, and there was a change last week because of the decision of the Prime Minister and then the opposition made to to pick a, a target for their anguish and angst about these protests. So that was a development. But, um, I mean, I take the point that it, it it does, it's frustrating when people are gathering in such numbers if they're not being reported on the television news every night. But I suspect, without asking anyone directly, that that's part of it. Yeah. Um, I was also reflecting on before October 7, um, the Netanyahu government in Israel was facing enormous civil political protests um, quite regularly about uh, some of the reforms it was intending to make to its legal system and its courts in particular. Um, and, you know, I wonder if if these protests gather momentum as we go, not saying this government is anywhere near on the nose as the Netanyahu government was there, but it is kind of, you know, uh, the longer things go on as well, they can gather their own head of steam. Um, yeah, and I should I should just add there, remember in this environment, um, the traditional news media doesn't have the same influence that it used to have. It used to be the only source of information for people and if it wasn't on the news, people didn't know about it. That is not the case now. If that was the case, we wouldn't be seeing you know, people, it would be much harder for, for for these gatherings to be happening in the in the size and manner that they are. People have other ways of communicating and governments are very acutely aware of these protests, whether the television news reports them or not. Um, so I think they do still have an influence on government, the fact that people are gathering, whether the TV news at 6 o'clock or 6.30 or whatever time is is broadcasting the images it or not, you know, social media is is doing a lot of that work, um, and enabling people to gather and and uh, amplifying their voices. Um, the next question I've got is from Deb Campbell, and it's back to the issue of the media again. She asks, "Would either of you like to comment on the recent speech by Michael Miller, who's the head of?" Uh, News Corp um, at the press club last week, all his concern about the bullying of social media. Um, and her comment is, I guess, on the hypocrisy of News Corp there. Um, but uh, for people who didn't follow that, he addressed the National Press Club and kind of talked about the fact that, um, you know, social media was toxic and there's a lot of uh, bullying, misinformation, um, violence and other things happening on those platforms uh, and really asking the government to better regulate um, big tech and, and social media in particular. 
Um, but yeah, a, a lot of comments on, I guess, the role that News Corp itself has played in bullying a lot of people over the years. Um, is he the right messenger for that? Um, Karen, do you have any reflections on uh, either his comments or the response to them? Well, um, gosh, <laughs> where do we start? Uh, I think the, you know, it's not a new debate to say, there's a social media is a double-edged sword it does a lot of good it's done a lot of great things for putting people in touch with each other for passing spreading information for connections um it also has a downside along the lines of what you just described there is a lot of bullying um there is a lot of harassment that, that occurs a lot of amplification of uh ideas that are sometimes false um so you know, I'd be lying for disinformation and disinformation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's bots. We've got AI engaging now. You know, it's hard to tell truth from fiction. It's hard to tell real video from from fakes. So, you know, it, it, there's very much an upside and a downside to social media. Having said that, of course, News Corp also has an agenda because, for the reasons we just talked about, <laughs> social media has has been the great challenge to traditional media. Um, and when you're a money earning corporation, uh, you don't like anything that, that challenges your, um, your revenue base. It doesn't like public broadcasters either for the same reason, because they give out the news for free. So um, that's not, it's not to say he wasn't making some reasonable points about concern about social media and their points that people in government opposition all, all around the place parents, kids, everyone's made the same sorts of criticisms about the potential dangers of social media. Um, but sometimes the people who make them have a have another agenda as well. So I suppose that's what I would say, that it's um, there's more than one agenda. Mm. There, may, there may be some that are, that are more broadly held and endorsed than, than other aspects of that. Yeah, and um, if I could uh, just give my two cents on that as well, I think you're absolutely right. Like you raise really important issues and I think governments all around the world are really grappling with how do we effectively regulate big tech when they are global companies, they're hard to pin down in a specific place, um, you know, they don't pay a lot of tax, they're, they're, capital, they're worth more than a lot of whole countries and their economies, like... They're quite politically powerful and, and hard to pin down. Australia was really world leading with the news media bargaining code, but um, we've seen, you know, that the the big tech companies were really willing to throw their weight around to um, avoid being regulated on that. You know, we had a blackout from Facebook. Um, YouTube kind of got all its creators on board to talk about what a disaster it would be. Um, through Google and, you know, they they do have a lot of power and access to a lot of people. It's, it is really hard for governments to effectively regulate, but they kind of, they have to, they have to keep trying to innovate and find ways to do it. Um, but the only other comment I would make is um, I actually wrote my column uh, in the Canberra Times about this on the weekend. If people want to check it out, it's on our website and just kind of reflecting on, um, I think people rightly pointing out the hypocrisy of the head of News Corp, um, which, you know, its parent organisation is also the organisation of phone hacking in the UK. Um, you know, it's got a lot of great journalists, but here in Australia, um, the Australian in particular, and a lot of Murdoch outlets have really targeted particular individuals. And I think in here of... Um, Brittany Higgins uh, and some of the coverage and um, publishing some of her um, text messages and other things from her phone. Uh, uh, Yasmin um, Abdel-Majid, who ended up having to leave the country because she was being bullied so hard. Uh, you know, there's, I think, people pointing out um, correctly some of the hypocrisy there coming from the head of uh, News Corp on that. Um, we've got Julie Parker asking about the NAC here. I think Julie here is referring to the fact that the the new National Anti-Corruption Commission declined to investigate uh, robo-debt, the re referrals made to it from the robo-debt Royal Commission. Um, I think it's really uh, dis disappointing for a lot of people from this new organisation um, and I also uh, think that there's been a big push now. Um, the commissioner from that um, Royal Commission sealed a couple of the findings from that because they were making references to the NAC that they're now not pursuing. 
Um, Karen, I know you've been writing about transparency um, in a couple of other ways too and, and what the government's been doing in that space. Do you have any reflections on that? So I think the frustration with the, the NAC decision is we've got transparency insofar as they're letting us know the results, but we don't in so far as we don't know their thinking, the reasoning behind what they have decided. I guess we have to um, think about the fact that they do have quite specific, um, it's not terms of reference, but they have terms, of legislated requirements, and they make the point, as I recall it in the statement they made, that they felt that it didn't, you know, it didn't fall within their remit or it did, you know, they made it, there was a phrase like that, which suggests that it didn't, that what what was alleged against individuals didn't quite fit what um, what they were able to pursue. And that, that's not to say that things weren't done that were wrong. Um, it it suggests, I think, that, that, that they felt that they weren't the right organisation to deal with it. And we might well say, well, where is the right organisation? Uh, I think the Public Service Commission is, is examining further um, some of the allegations made against some individuals. Um, but there is always, well, I shouldn't say there's always, but there is going to be a gap in this case anyway between public expectations and what these agencies are going to deliver. Mm. Um, but we do still have this whole question of accountability and, you know, it's, I, I still think it's massively important to pursue accountability in as many ways as we can, especially with a government that said it would be accountable and campaigned on it very strongly. Um, the story I wrote you mentioned was in relation to a freedom of information case uh, that Rex Patrick, the former senator, ran recently. He he tried to get some documents from uh, the Morrison government when Christian Porter was Attorney General about the sports rorts grants, sports grants, the thing we all nicknamed sports rorts. Um, that was the FOI was refused at the time. It went to the information commissioner, which is the process that gets followed. Um, and by the time the information commissioner finally finished that, um, Christian Porter was no longer attorney general. There had been Michaelia Cash, and then the government had changed, and there was Mark Dreyfus. And so the government, or the information commissioner, argued, "Oh well, the information is no longer held by the attorney general because the information was belonged to the person who was attorney general, not to the office." Now, what the federal court found is Rex Patrick challenged that, and the federal court found in his favour, and said, "No, no, the information should be passed." from one attorney general to the next attorney general. And so whenever there's a, an FOI that's already on foot, they can't just say, oh, the, the convention is we don't hand the information on. You know, it must be it must be kept and preserved and handed on until that whole process is complete. They can't just say, I don't possess it anymore because I'm a different attorney general. So there's that. But in the course of that, what also emerged was debate about the fact that given that governments have assumed they don't have to hand these things on to the next government, they shred stuff. They shred stuff when they're leaving office, documents that arguably should not be shredded. Um, sometimes it's personal documents, but, you know, it may well be that some of the documents are stuff that should be protected under the Archives Act. And the judge herself said, you know, hang on a minute, you guys, what are you doing? You may well be in, in, engaging in criminal conduct. If you are relying on a convention that says, oh, we don't hand these documents on to the next person, which the judge has found in, in these particular circumstances when there's an FOI is no longer, that's not right, then what are you doing shredding documents? You shouldn't be doing it. The Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, has lodged a challenge to that ruling. And the implication of that challenge is he's not only seeking to overturn this thing about having to hand documents on to the next Attorney General, but by implication, he's seeking the right to continue to shred things. Um, and I'm not sure that that meets the test of public expectations. I don't reckon they think it's a good idea for the governments to be able to shred their documents. Maybe I'm, mm. I should speak for myself, but I think it's a very interesting case and we'll see where it goes. But that goes to this whole point about, you know, what definition of accountability, accountability in what context. And um, I think there's still a bit of a way to go. And I'm a bit obsessed with the whole FOI thing and information that is supposed to be, that is threatening national security um, versus information that just might be embarrassing. Yeah, exactly. And it makes me wonder, you know, the last election integrity was such a huge issue. The The Labor government has brought in the national, like the NAC, the, the corruption watchdog that's, you know, people have been disappointed by it, this first ruling. Um, you've got stuff like this. We've got a whistleblower in in jail now for blowing the whistle on war crimes. Um, at, like, 
yeah, it makes me wonder if integrity is going to be still a potent issue, particularly for independents and the Greens come the next election. Things are a little bit disappointing. Yeah, well, just uh, I'm, I, I often do this, but with David McBride, he he wasn't blowing the whistle on war crimes. He was blowing the whistle, and he is a whistleblower. And that, so mm. the arguments still stand about do we treat a whistleblower like this? But he was actually making the opposite argument. He was seeking to alert journalists to the fact that he believed that soldiers were um, not being given enough protection to uh, to act and engage in acts of violence where they need to, he he argued. So he wasn't saying, hey, these might be war crimes. He was saying, hey, they're not war crimes and they should be better protected. It's just that when the journalists looked at it, they saw a different story. They were like, that, oops, war crimes. Yeah. But that doesn't mean he's not a whistleblower. He was just, he was blowing the whistle on something else. But that does it. it does, well, the issue of whistleblowing then goes to the question of whether you can justify it as being a legitimate, you know, that there wasn't another course, you know, as, as the whistleblower laws, uh, which are complicated, say. Um, but there is still definitely a question of of people who feel they have no other, nowhere else to go with the information that they believe is in the public interest and what happens to them. Yeah. Um, I think we might have to wrap it up there. I can see a couple of other questions here. I'm sorry we won't get to them. I can see someone asking about uh, how many small modular reactors are currently operational worldwide. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I can yeah, do it. And I don't think there's any in the sense that, you know, an off-the-shelf nuclear reactor that comes off, you know, a production line somewhere. I don't think there's any, to be honest, and I know that the ones that the coalition was kind of talking about um, collapsed in a heap, costing the, the governments billions of dollars, I think, in the United States. So those are a little bit pie in the sky still at the moment, which is why Dutton's turned to talking about conventional nuclear reactors um, as well. I can see a couple of other questions in here about a Murdoch Royal Commission and other things. I'm sorry we won't get to those, um, but hopefully we've touched on a good number of topics today. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we put on these webinars for free and it is the Australia Institute's end of financial year appeal at the moment. So please head on over to our website at australiainstitute.org.au to chip in for that. You can double your donation and double the impact of it at the moment. Every donation until we reach our fundraising goal will be doubled Um matched dollar for dollar until we reach that goal. So please, uh, if you love our webinars, head on over and see if you can chip in to that. And I want to thank you, uh, Karen Middleton. I know you're always extremely busy. We appreciate your time and uh, we'll see you uh, the next time you come on. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for listening to my rambling on. <laughs> and thanks everyone for your fantastic questions. They're always really good. They touch on a huge number of issues and we love how much you're interested in federal politics. I think this is a really important part of engaging people in democracy and uh, not thinking that we can't change anything. So thanks very much for joining us today, everyone. We'll see you again soon. And uh, thanks again, Karen. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to keep up to date with all our latest research and work, sign up to our newsletter. Delivered every fortnight, it includes behind the scenes updates from Richard Dennis, an exclusive cartoon from Judy Horacek, details for our upcoming events and webinars, as well as explainers, graphs, and not to mention the latest cutting edge research and analysis from the team here on the key issues that are facing Australia. Click the button on your screen to check it out.